Alrighty. Good afternoon and welcome everyone to our next edition of the Downtown Now webinar series. My, na my name is Audrey Gerlach and I'm the Director of Strategic Initiatives with the Downtown Cleveland Alliance. I'll moderate a Q&A session following today's discussion. So throughout the webinar, please feel free to enter any questions in the Q&A button on your Zoom uh, menu bar. And if you're joining us on Facebook Live, feel free to submit questions using the comment section. This way we'll have some questions lined up and ready to go when we start the Q&A. So thank you. I will now turn it over to our Executive Vice President for Business Development, Michael Diemer. Thank you, Audrey. And once again, I'd like to welcome all of the attendees in the audience to another episode of the Downtown Now webinar series, which we produce in partnership with Cleveland Magazine. For those of you who might not be aware, I'd like to tell you a little bit about Downtown Cleveland Alliance, who we are and what we do. We are the only nonprofit entity solely dedicated to making Downtown Cleveland the region's most compelling place to live, work, play, and visit. By definition, we are a place-based development organization representing property owners, large middle market and small businesses, residents, and civic partners in downtown Cleveland. For 15 years now, we have concentrated our efforts to create a pedestrian-friendly environment that attracts additional investment into downtown Cleveland. Our business development center markets downtown as a destination for innovators, disruptors, entrepreneurs, and serves as the go-to resource for real estate professionals and business leaders to connect with the assistance they need in order to relocate, grow, or develop in downtown Cleveland. Working closely with our strategic and neighborhood-based partners, we're building a place where residents and office workers alike can walk to meet their daily needs and wants. We know that an, invest an investment-ready downtown begins with cleanliness and safety. That's why our clean and safe ambassadors have remained on the job through the pandemic, completing essential duties to keep downtown Cleveland clean and safe for residents and office workers. We've shown our gratitude to our ambassadors by creating the Ambassador Appreciation Program, which provides each ambassador with a daily lunch as they go about their duties. You can find out how to donate to our Ambassador Appreciation page on our webpage at downtowncleveland.com. As I stated earlier, we launched our Downtown Now webinar series in partnership with Cleveland Magazine and Community Leader, who are our media sponsors. Uh, in this rapidly changing environment, we've utilized the webinar platform to deliver resources and updates, uh, bolster our economic resilience, and provide the latest insight on initiatives across the downtown community. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the return uh, to office. Uh, back on May 4th, uh, Governor Mike DeWine uh, issued uh, executive guidance uh, authorizing uh, office workers uh, to begin to uh, return to the office under uh, some guidelines promulgated by the state. Uh, and over the last month, uh, office workers in downtown have begun to do that. And we anticipate over the next 30 days that uh, that process will continue and accelerate. Today, we have two guests that are uh, very well versed in how uh, downtown tenants uh, have uh, navigated uh, the new guidance from the state on returning to the office. Uh, we're joined by David Browning, Managing Director and Northeast Ohio Market Leader for CBRE. Uh, and we're also joined by Ryan Newmeyer, attorney at McDonald Hopkins. He's a member of the Litigation Department's Labor and Employment Practice Group. Uh, welcome, David and Ryan, and, and thank you for joining us. Thrilled to be here. Well, Thanks, I, Michael. I thought, I, I thought David, I, I'd begin with you and ask you to set the stage for us a little bit. And, maybe wind the clock back uh, all the way to uh, January of, of 2019, or 2020, excuse me. Uh, and it, it, it kind of set the stage for us uh, what, the, what your perception was of uh, the downtown Cleveland uh, office market in particular uh, entering 2020, what some of the, the trends were and, and what you were anticipating as the year began. Well, Michael, it's a, it's a great question, great place to start. And you know, it, when you, you ask the question, it just seems like a long time ago. Uh, but you know, we were all in this together before dealing with issues of downtown. And if you think about it, we were in a very active market um, and there was continued in migration to downtown Cleveland and the driver of it, um, we were in a very tight labor market. And so it was all about attraction and retention of workers. And so we had a very dynamic situation that was going on. You know, we've successfully 
repositioned and renovated 5 million square feet of space into alternate use or upgraded office. Um, and then, you know, we were in the midst of the whole Sherwin-Williams situation. And, you know, you're probably aware we got the, the downtown part of that transaction completed in the first quarter, right as things happened. And then the subsequent thing will happen um, in, later this year. But so it was, we were in an active and just an incredibly interesting time. And we were looking forward to more sales and renovations of downtown buildings uh, for you know, the tax credit rehab things that we've been working on. Uh, and then we were focused on really trying to fill some of the gaps in retail, as you recall. And we had recently done the Shake Shack transaction on, on Euclid Avenue, felt that there was more to come. And so, you know, obviously as things played out in mid-March, who would have thought we'd be where we're at today, where we've now in, endured the most significant run-up um, in unemployment. And it's it, it just it, talk about a disrupted market and, and so rapidly. Um, and, and yet, you know, the, the world, the sky isn't falling, but these are very unique times that we're in. But the good news is, is that we started off in such a great place. I'm certain that we're going to end up uh, in an okay place. Well, let's, Ryan, I'd like to, to turn to you and, and talk a little bit about that, uh, that, that uh, those few days in, in, in March when, when things really began to change uh, and ask how, how McDonald Hopkins as uh, uh, a, a downtown uh, employer uh, uh, approached, um, you know, the, the governor's uh, orders to, uh, you know, stay at home and, and work from home. How did uh, McDonald Hopkins uh, implement that and adapt? You know, Michael, that's a great question. First, again, I want to thank you for, for having me. And, and uh, you know, you have a wonderful work organization. From someone that works downtown, I go to dinner downtown. I'm, I'm downtown quite a bit. Um, I, I love seeing your ambassadors. I, I do. And I, I go up to them and thank them. And, uh, you know, if, at the end of this, if you could repeat that, uh, that website, I'd love to go and, and donate to something that's such a great part of, of Cleveland. And, uh, yeah. but, uh, you know, I was talking to a friend about this and it's kind of like, you know, for, for the first time, you know, we, we, we were kind of part of 9-11 in a way, if, if you were alive at that time or, or, you know, an adult. Um, I was in law school at Cleveland State University um, you know, I, I went through the 08 downturn um, as a lawyer, an employment lawyer. And, and at the outset of this, this is kind of the, what, what I was relying on. I was thinking about 2008. And then um, I had also it, go back to, to January. Uh, I wrote an article uh, about um, the pandemic. And uh, I, I had taken an old article that I had written, uh, full disclosure, in 2009. Uh, for the swine flu, H1N1, and kind of repurposed it a little bit, looked at what was going on in, 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 you know, across the country, who was talking about it, what the CDC was saying. And then I looked at general pandemic guidance. And, and, and so I had an article out back, back in January, and we did a, um, we did a webinar, the 20 uh, employment law challenges for 2020 uh, in January. And we did have a slide um, on the, a, a slide on COVID-19 and the, the pandemic. Since that time, uh, all 20 topics would be COVID-19, I think, at this point. So it's like I, I was talking to my counterpart in Detroit, uh, Miriam Rosen, and uh, we couldn't believe that we had done that webinar. So much has happened. So, you know, fast forward to March, we kind of already were thinking about these issues. Um, between Miriam and I and some of the others in the labor and employment um, section at McDonald Hopkins. Um, so I, I think for me personally, it was when, you know, uh, the president came on and, and the NBA canceled their season. Um, at that point, I was like, okay, well, you know, this is, this is th certainly for real. Um, I was involved with some trade associations uh, that canceled events um, and, and 
you know, being an attorney on the board, I, I get pulled into those discussions. Um, so we as an office started discussing, well, what are next steps? And, and, and our managing partner, uh, Sean Riley, kind of kind of took the, the horns, <laughs> the bull by the horns with the executive committee. And, and pretty short thereafter, it was decided that, you know, we would be um, staying, staying at home and working from home mostly because we could. Um, and then we continued on with a lot of, some of our, um, our accounting department and some of our other workers who need to be in the office, we had them um, still going in, socially distancing, um, following guidelines. So, you know, from a, um, it, it, I wouldn't say seamless, um, because I don't know that anybody's um, been seamless in this entire process. Uh, I certainly miss the interaction um, with other attorneys and other workers. And, uh, and, and I think it, it certainly is an advantage to be in person. But, um, you know, I, I think we've kind of pulled through this uh, with, with, with the steps following. And I, and I think the governor and, and the state's done a good job of, of providing guidance as a lot of other governmental institutions, to, uh, the CDC, uh, even OSHA has, you know, given us, given us guidance on how to move forward. Well, in, in, let's uh, you know, talk about uh, some of that, that guidance. Um, you know, David, back on, on, on May 4th, or I guess a few days before May 4th, the, you know, the governor uh, uh, issued some guidance uh, for uh, office businesses uh, about how they could uh, safely uh, transition uh, workers back to an office environment. Uh, you know, tell me a little bit about uh, how CBRE has uh, responded to that guidance uh, as an office tenant, uh, but also, uh, you know, in, in your role in, as a real estate advisor and in, in advising both landlords and, and tenants, um, if you could tell us a, a little bit about what you've seen uh, over the last uh, the last couple of weeks. Absolutely, uh, you know, and I, I wear different hats in that, you know, I'm responsible for the CBRE operations in Northeast Ohio. We've got about 400 plus employees that are either in our facilities or embedded with clients, um, Cleveland Clinic, KeyBank, people like that, that we do facilities management for. So there's a lot of different perspectives um, on this. And, you know, I would also say is that um, kind of on the question that you were dealing, asking Ryan uh, about is that in early March, you know, CBRE is a global company and we're, we're on the front line managing properties in China. And then we were having major issues in Europe. And at the time, um, New York was just starting as a hotspot. Seattle was the hotspot. And all of a sudden I was alerted that, look, you need to get on this conference call right now. And it was all of our property management leadership getting really deep into what was going on. And all of a sudden I like, whoa, about 10 days before everything really happened, I realized that, wow, this is different, this is global, and this is gonna be an issue. Um, so here we sit and, you know, back on your question now with, you know, the governors, okay, non-essential businesses can be returning to work. Well, um, we as CBRE, because we're not only got our own facilities, but we're dealing with all of our clients and their facilities, we've really come up with um, a framework to look at it. And then our clients need to make their own decisions within the framework because of their employer employee relationship. Um, from our perspective, we think that there's three components of the return to work. And just to provide context, you know, here we sit now, May 28th, and of our big downtown office towers, we're still at less than 5% occupancy. So not many of the tenants have really returned. And let's get into some of why that is. Um, and, and what we're seeing is there's three components of reopening the space. Number one, it's what's going on in the community. And you're looking at um, you know, infection rates and are they dropping? And within our organization, um, we're not allowed to re-enter um, unless we have 12 consecutive days in Cuyahoga County with declining cases. Well, 
the problem is it, it, the devil's in the detail related to the metrics because we're doing more testing now. So the numbers, even though we may be better statistically, you know, we've got to get to those numbers. And some people are saying it's six, K, six days, 12, 30 um, are what firms are looking at, but it's the context in the community. And, you know, in Cleveland, um, we're not as, my operation, because it's a brokerage operation, a lot of my people drive to and from work, they're with clients all the time. So we're not relying on mass transit, but think about New York, Atlanta, Chicago, where our employees are riding mass transit. That's a whole nother metric in the community. So that's number one is in the community. Number two is the building in the facility that you're going to occupy. If it's a high rise office building, okay, what is the protocol that's going on? You typically are only allowing two or three people in an elevator at a time. What is management and security doing regarding that? You also want touchless technology. You don't want people touching buttons, doors, washroom fixtures and the like. So there's all sorts of touchless technology that a lot of building owners are now implementing. And then em employers are concerned about what that is about and what the experience of their employee coming in and coming out of the building. Um, and then thirdly, it's what's going on in the space. What is your new cleaning protocol? Um, like in our office, we're at no point in time until there is a vaccine, we will not be occupying at more than about 40% occupancy. So we've got different shifts of people um, on various days. And then because of this notion of you've got to queue up and go through security to get to the up the elevator, um, we're going to be having people work different shifts as well. So not everyone is arriving at eight in the morning and departing at five. So there's just a lot of things and what we're having to do, and I know a lot of other national and global public companies, we're having to actually go through and get approval to reoccupy space. Uh, and then there's the other element that, that we were talking about, you know, are employees comfortable? Um, do they have situations, whether it's childcare, whether it is um, seniors that are living in their household, Anything that puts them at risk makes it concern to return until there's a vaccine. So it's a long-winded answer, but we clearly need to increase the amount of occupancy in order to be in order to be productive, uh, but also to restart everything we know and value downtown. Ryan, let, let me go over to to you because um, you know D David described uh, a lot of the, the the measures that both uh, office tenants and uh, uh, buildings are, are taking to, you know, try to uh, ensure that uh, employees are are safe and feel safe uh, and, and comfortable. Uh, I wonder if you could speak to what uh, you are seeing uh, in, in your position uh, in, in hearing from businesses about uh, issues related to potential liability of, you know, if, if workers are exposed or uh, are, are, are diagnosed and uh, how that's factoring into uh, decision making about how to handle uh, bringing uh, workers back into the office. Yeah, and that's that's a question we've been getting a lot. So that's a good question: is is what what's our liability? You know, if if, if we were to um, begin operations again, um, and, and again, there's a lot of uh, businesses that that are essential. working with throughout this so we do kind of have some of the test cases of bringing people back and you know in those particular instances we're, we're, we're making sure our tools are clean everybody's social distancing when they can sometimes they can't you know so um, we're looking at environmental controls or plexiglass things like that um, but the cases that we've seen filed so far I mean you kind of have two issues of liability one is you know, your employees, and then you have third parties, potentially. And then, you know, to, in an office setting, um, you, with this type of, of threat, you're only as, as safe as your neighbor, right? 
Um, so you could be doing a great job doing all of these things that, that need to be done that the CDC, that OSHA, the Ohio Department of Health is telling you to do, uh, but your neighbor's not doing any of them. They have an outbreak. They're touching you know, the buttons in the elevator. That's why it's so important for what David said to coordinate with our landlords and, and our other tenants to make sure that everybody are practicing um, these, these different uh, steps and, and the guidance that, that I had talked about previously. Um, but, but to defend yourself, so, so far what we've seen in those cases, I think there was one filed in Illinois against Walmart. There was a young man who, who passed away. Um, and, and then I saw one in, I, I think it was Missouri. Uh, there was one filed in, in Texas as well. Um, and uh, what, what I'm seeing in those cases, uh, I, and there was a third party uh, lawsuit filed um, for an outbreak as well that I saw, and I can't recall which state, but all of the cases I've read the complaints and they're basically all alleging that the employers or the businesses in those situations didn't take um, the steps that have been outlined by the CDC or by OSHA or by the State Department of Health. Um, so really by doing the things uh, that the uh, state or you know the social distancing, making sure everything's disinfected, looking for touch points, evaluating your facility, evaluating your workforce, staggering shifts, doing all of those things will assist in mitigating against um, you know, liability. The other thing that's happening now state to state, um, and even on a federal level, I don't know that that's ever gonna happen, but it could happen in the state. There's some safe harbors um, that different legislatures are trying to pass, which would insulate certain employers from um, normal negligence uh, but, you know, allow uh, plaintiffs to bring cases where employers are reckless and essentially not following, you know, the, the guidelines or the best practices that are being put out there by the state and, and the federal government. Well, it's setting, setting aside the, the issues of, of liability for a, a moment, um, because, it, it, you know, one of the things we've, we've talked about from a, a a public policy perspective is, you know, both Congress and the, the General Assembly are, are, are looking at those issues and uh, that, that may, may come into play and, and influence how um, both tenants and, and landlords think about these issues. But David, I'd, I'd like to go back to, to you and, and uh, talk about one of the, the issues that's been central to our thinking at, at, at Downtown Cleveland Alliance over the last uh, uh, couple of weeks and, and months. And as we talk to some of our peers uh, around the country, uh, and, and that's the, the the future of work. Uh, you know, there, there's there's a school of thought that, uh, gee, uh, uh, every employers have found that people can uh, work from home and uh, still be very productive. Uh, and you know, maybe this is the future of of work. And you talked about you know building occupancy at five percent. Is that is that the future for downtowns? Uh, we absolutely we, not. <laughs> we don't think so, but I want to get your your, your thoughts about that. Well, it, you know, it, it's funny because obviously you and I talk on our on a regular basis, and you know, three plus weeks ago, it, it, it was related to the office market. It was all about oh, this social distancing thing um, is going to dominate the thinking long run. Um, the, so the the trend toward densification of the office is that's out the window forever. Um, and then people, you know, it, sure enough, working remotely, the technology seems to work. Uh, certain people are able to do it. They're productive, they're effective, this, that, and the other thing. However, it is, you know, now you're getting deeper into this time when we've all been hunkered down and working remotely. And here we are on a Zoom call. And, you know, that I've gotten, so I'm spending, you know, three to six hours a day on these Zoom calls. It's crazy. And it's not fulfilling. It's not satisfying, this, that, and the other thing. So actually, we as CBRE, because we're kind of invested in this space, we've actually started doing some research. And we, as I shared with you, we did a study in Boston 
of our employees as well as clients on this. And we really have kind of gotten to the bottom that, yeah, okay, um, we're at this moment in time, but long run, um, especially uh, firms that need to collaborate, have a creative thought process. There's a sense of culture and camaraderie that is an essential part of business that the office space fulfills a very important need. And that isn't gonna go away, but we just have to, you know, obviously get people back and comfortable. We're gonna have this near-term period where we, until we have a vaccine, we're gonna to have to have this, these different protocols. Um, and, and not everyone is gonna be comfortable. So that comes back to the notion of the bell curve, that you've got the extremes on either side of people that are, I'm not coming back, I'm not feeling safe, to people that are, look, I've been in my basement and I've got you know, a family, I, I, I need to get out of here because I've got clients to serve. And so we've got those extremes and then there's the middle. But, you know, but so I think the futures of downtown are, are bright because we have created environments of live, work, play. We'll tweak it related to what needs to happen in terms of cleaning standards and some notion of social distancing and, and we'll move on. But the initial disruption that happened right after we all, you know, had to go through the stay at home order, um, that's just an overreaction of the pendulum swinging. We're, we're gonna come back. And, but you know, the dynamic now that we're seeing with clients, yes, they wanna take care of their employees um, and their clients, um, but they also though, as a business, are looking to reduce capital expend, uh, expenditures and reduce operating expenses. So we've got some new dynamics that will drive activity in the market, but we're not gonna walk away from everything, all the success that we've had in downtown live, work, play, and all the people that want to be here. Well, we've, we've, I appreciate that. We've had a, a similar experience at, at DCA where, you know, we, we certainly went through a, a period where we were, uh, like everyone, uh, working uh, uh, very much remotely and we found we could all be uh, very productive, but, you know, I think being, being productive uh, is, is kind of the uh, the baseline. Uh, I think we, we all aspire for something greater than, than re remaining productive. And, you know, I, I think we found we, we were missing a lot of, um, we were missing each other. We were missing the, uh, uh, the, 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 the sparks that come from creativity uh, and, and collaborating and, and just, uh, you know, we're, we're more than the sum of our parts uh, when, when we're all together. Uh, and and uh, I think looking forward to, to, to getting back to that. Ryan, I'm curious, you know, I've talked with a lot of law firms uh, downtown over the last uh, a couple of months uh, about their experiences. Um, again, finding that people can uh, work from home, uh, but as, as, you know, as you look at the experience uh, at, at McDonald Hopkins, uh, you know, what, uh, what is your sense of uh, the, the, how things are likely to proceed over the next, uh, couple of months and in the long run for your firm. But, you know, I'd also ask you, you know, what you're seeing across uh, the, the, the profession about how you think uh, law firms may be likely to respond in, in the long run. Yeah, and I, I think that's a, that's a good question. And, and uh, you know, law firms tend to be traditional and, uh, you know, having an office to go into and, and, and having, you know, interaction with, with staff and other attorneys, I think is, it's necessary to the practice of law. Um, there's a lot of communication that goes on daily. I think from even, you know, a business development standpoint, um, you're out, you're meeting clients, there's activities, there's seminars, there's things that you, you know, you really need that in-person interaction to, to really get the full effect of, of what you're trying to do. Um, you know, I, and I think, uh, I, I think I personally, you know, I worked um, out of the office and typically I would come home and work once in a while, but I usually would rather stay late and get what I need to get done in the office. Um, now, having worked at home, 
I'll probably be a little bit more apt to work from home, even on the weekends, because I used to be someone that would go into the office on the weekends. Um, so personally, I've become more comfortable. But I will tell you, last week I, I went in and we are separating. We have three groups right now. And I know I've talked to other attorneys. Um, I'm on uh, employment defense, so I'll talk to a lot of plaintiff's attorneys throughout, throughout the day. And a lot of them are going in. Um, because we were deemed essential uh, and they're going into their offices and working from their office. There's also, you know, a data privacy issue, um, you know, keeping uh, not that our, our data, it, it's a little bit more difficult when you have different terminals, you know, from tele uh, telecommuting. So, so that's always an issue, um, you know, which, which is something that that's been addressed um, in different ways. Uh, but last week I went in on my day and there was another attorney uh, whom I'm pretty fr good friends with. And it was about the best day I had in a long time and work-wise because we got to go and we were downtown on Euclid and we went to the new, uh, went to a newer restaurant there, a lunch spot and grabbed something to eat and had a coffee and talked. And we actually came away with a couple of ideas, um, you know, so, so that's not something that would have happened if we were you know at home uh and we've talked him and i have talked a number of times throughout this and that really i think that in-person interaction fostered uh kind of the collaborative thinking that that david was talking about that's re really needed not only in the legal community but just in the business uh community in general so i i don't think you know while i do believe that there will be more um telecommuting permitted um, I think employers will become more comfortable with allowing uh, some of their employees to work from home. Um, I've had a lot of clients that want their employees back in the office too. So, you know, they're, they're you know, not quite as comfortable with that situation. Mm -hmm. David, let me ask you how that may, may translate into uh, commercial real estate uh, trends in, in, in the, the near term and the long term. You know, as we, as we began the year, uh, co-working was a big trend, uh, office space uh, was a big trend. Uh, and, you know, now we're talking more and more about uh, uh, spreading uh, people out uh, more in, in office space. And, you know, the trend had been to, you know, Kind of squeeze as many people into uh, space as possible. What, what do you think some of the the, the short and, and long term uh, office trends may be from a real estate perspective? Well, I, I think there's going to be a lot of thought um, and dialogue that happens between office occupiers, um, the architects, and you know the the furniture supply firms um, that you know, come up with these creative designs because um, we still um, want a workplace that is going to be clean, safe, uh, and then you've got the environment that you can collaborate um, with others. Um, and you bring up the co-working um, situation. Um, I think, obviously, we've got this weird dynamic with, you know, the, the global leader in that we work melting down and going through a restructuring. They just were so aggressive in their um, approach. But the reality is, is that co-working or call it agile, flexible real estate does have a need um, that corporate occupiers have for flexibility in these dynamic markets. So we're going to see all of this stuff kind of evolve um, over time. And, you know, it, and that's why coming out of this, it, we're going to be, we had such a good run before. And now we're going to have this incredible period where there's going to be dynamic and dramatic change that goes on. And think about it. And it relates to supply chain and online ordering. I mean, this whole thing that we've, um, had happened has just accelerated um, the, the trend by years into online purchases and, you know, more and more, more and more growth with Amazon. And, but then at the same time, 
we've got notions about supply chain um, and where we've had disruption in the supply chain related our response to the pandemic, as well as we were also experiencing some challenges due to trade um, issues that were going on globally that were disrupting the supply chain um, prior to the pandemic. And now that's kind of happened in a big way. So, and we, we've been involved in, in some situations here in Northeast Ohio with manufacturing jobs that actually are gonna come back. They're onshoring into Ohio and elsewhere in the United States because of these supply chain issues. And so there's just, a, I know I'm going beyond just the office market here, but it, it is a dramatic um, acceleration of the drivers of change as we come out of this. Well, that's, that's a good point too, David. And I, I just want to jump in real quick because I, I see that as an opportunity, what you talked about, and, and we're really um, uniquely situated in Northeast Ohio to take advantage of that onshoring. And I think, you know, you're going to see additional need for services come out of that. We do have, you know, office space. And, and so, you know, I, one other point that, that you made that I'd like to comment on is I do represent a few um, architect firms, and I've been asked that question as an employment lawyer about the open floor plan as opposed to the, clo the closed floor plan. And I've read some, um, some, some reports or, 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 or uh, you know, different, different investigations and, and studies on that issue. And uh, they've been coming out that actually the open floor plan is, is a less, less productive floor plan for, for office space. So I do foresee us having, you know, if cubicles to the ceiling or some sort of probably more separated office. But I also, I have a, a good friend, he, he, um, he's a professor at the Army War College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. And uh, he's writing a book on the Battle of the Argonne in World War I. So he's done a lot of study uh, on the Spanish flu, which, by the way, started in Kansas. So according to him, to Dr. Tom, Tom Bersino. Uh, so to Dr. Tom says it started in Kansas, maybe, maybe South Africa. But he reminded me, well, what happened after you know, World War I? We had the Roaring Twenties, too. I know it's a different time and everything, but I, I think in the middle of this, it's hard to get perspective. And so we have a lot of folks that are just, you know, jumping on and, and doing and taking action. And maybe sometimes we need to, you know, just take a step back. Let's look and see what happens too. Let's put our toe in the water. Maybe it's not going to be that different. We, we really, you know, I, I think there will be change, but I don't know how significant it's going to be yet. Yeah, I, I would say, Ryan, right on point with that, you, you talk about the um, open plan versus um, private offices. And we just took a listing on a downtown office tower uh, to lease second generation space. And sure enough, my sales professionals in January and February were going to that owner and say, and it, it was um, five floors of law firm built out space. And we were saying, oh, you'll never lease it like that. You should demolish at least one of those floors and then we'll take the CAD drawings and create one of these virtual marketing tools as to how an office user would visualize open plan and modern office space. Well, now we're saying, time out. Let's leave it exactly as it is because we think we could probably find an office user that would take you know, traditional second generation law firm space. And I'm talking about the, you know, the kind of the older school law firm space of, you know, managing partner and, you know, three different size offices, et cetera, et cetera. Um, whereas, you know, the modern configuration with private offices, everyone's kind of the same. So we'll see how this plays out and we're just playing it by ear. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, well, I know we've got a couple of questions starting to trickle in uh, from our, our audience. Um, Audrey, can I uh, pivot over to you and can you let us know what the, the audience is thinking about? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, the three of you have talked a little bit about, um, you've all kind of touched on the benefits of uh, employing um, 
you know, getting back to the office. Um, can you talk a little bit more about what some of those look like beyond just the, you know, interactions that, that can happen um, unplanned? Say that again in terms of... Um, some of the benefits of being back in the office space versus remote working. Well, it, it's clearly, you know, it, it's getting people together and then Ryan covered it. it the, when we first designed our space, the architect said, oh, we're going to have serendipitous collaboration. I'm going, what is that? And, but it's just people running into each other and, you know, they all of a sudden connect the dots on a problem or an opportunity. And, you know, that's the creative moment. And, you know, that's what we're, we're missing is that spontaneity and just the, the need to be together. Yeah. Thank you. And on the flip side of that, um, companies that uh, allow for flexible work uh, from home policies often have a competitive edge when it comes to talent attraction. How do you think that um, going forward, having all this work from home experience that we do now, um, will this mean that downtown employers can cast a wider net in their recruitment uh, practices? Well, I actually did a um, talk a couple of talks on this subject and it was um it had to do with millennials essentially and flexibility and that was one of the um one of the things that they really sought after uh in 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 in, in a in a work environment is they want flexibility and you know at the end of the day when you look at what what it is they want i i think everybody um would like to have flexibility with their work where they can you know, maybe have uh, a generous uh, vacation plan or be able to work from home um, w when they want, uh, those types of things. So I, I think that was already underway. Um, so I, I do expect, and I, I've seen uh, employers asking me more and more about flexible, flexible works uh, policies and telecommuting policies. So that's something you want to have in place, but you still want to have control over it. So if you need to have that person in the office and, and sometimes for different situations, um, maybe you want to be flexible um, because uh, it's, a, it's a mother uh, or, or a parent needs to take care of their children. So they'd like to work from home two out of the five days out of the week that that's a possibility, um, different things like that. But to answer your question, I, I, I have seen uh, employers asking me for, for those policies. And uh, I think it's a bad idea just to say, yeah, just, you know, work from home whenever, you know, or come into the office, do, do kind of what's best for you. Um, I think there should be some sort of procedure and structure to it because, you know, that that's going to foster productivity. Great. Thank you. Um, okay. Our next question. While downtown Cleveland has a dense and quickly growing urban core, it's not at the same scale as larger metro areas like Chicago and New York City. What advantages do you think this has? Um, it provides to office tenants looking to relocate, expand, or simply return to normal as we look to the future? Well, I mean, I would say that, you know, our region, um, it, it is significantly more affordable um, than New York and Chicago. And um, there was an ease of um, commute and lifestyle here. And, um, you know, we've seen that um, over the years. And, you know, I've, I've actually seen, uh, unfortunately, it's not major businesses, but, you know, a lot of employees that have migrated um, here from those areas because they just go, you know what? It's been great, but you know now I'm at a phase in my life where I'm looking at these other criteria, the quality of life things, and there's high quality of life in these second tier Midwestern markets, and in particular in Cleveland. Yeah, and I'm someone who I grew up in Cleveland, um, moved to Chicago for a period of time, and then then moved back to Cleveland, and we still. Um, Donald Hopkins has an office in Chicago and I'm licensed there. So I'll practice there from time to time. It, it's a little bit different, but I always say everything that I wanted or everything that I did in Chicago, I, I basically do in Cleveland. Uh, it just costs less and it's a lot easier. 
get around. Um, you know, I would say, you know, in the larger in the larger cities, it's a little bit easier to find some of the things. Um, whereas in Cleveland, you got to look a little bit sometimes uh, for for some of the things that you might want to do as far as entertainment goes. But um, it's all here and it's accessible, and uh, you know, we don't spend hours uh, driving or you know commuting to work. So it's it's I, I think a great uh, place to work and, and live. Thank you. And while we're on the subject of commuting, have you heard much from clients or colleagues or other contacts about um, what role commuting concerns play in their um, sort of comfort, comfort with uh, returning to the office? Well, I mean, just personally, I, I think that's one of the advantages, I would say, of, of telecommuting is that, you know, you don't have your commute. Um, but also for me personally, I mean, that's some time that I, it's not overly stressful. And I live in, in the southern suburbs. So I've got about a 20 minute to a half hour commute each day. And, and I'll listen to different um, radio programs or music. And, uh, you know, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not really stressed out by the traffic. So it's actually kind of something that sometimes I miss um, listening to the news or, or doing something like that. But I have not heard anybody um, concerned, you know, of, about the about the commute other than I've had a couple of um, employers that have had issues with uh, getting people to work and socially distancing at the same time because they shared rides. Um, there's also I think RTA is doing a good job right now of keeping their um, systems clean. They're disinfecting. Uh, so, I mean, what we did in those situations where we had ride sharers is we recommended, obviously, that if they can socially distance within the within the vehicle, that they should do so. Um, you know, unfortunately, in some of those situations, you know, we had essential workers that had to get to work at a certain time, and if they couldn't get to work at a certain time you know, because of their ride, uh, we didn't want them to be unsafe, but at the same time, I mean, we, we had to require that they be at work. Um, we certainly didn't terminate them or anything like that, but um, we were able to kind of work through the issue. Um, they were either able to sit in a, in a different seat in the car, um, but I, I'm unaware of anybody that's actually, you know, not been able to get to work, um, you know, because of, because of a commute. Audrey, I'd, I'd make the comment. I mean, we actually have a tool that we use um, for businesses called Commute Optimizer, where they actually, you know, provide us zip code information, you know, confidentially of their employees, it just anonymously. And we're able to, you know, tell them based on those, you know, where they're locating downtown or in a suburban location what's the optimal commute pattern for all of their employees um, based on that information. We do the same for industrial and logistics firms with their clients as to how they're distributing. And in, in really in Cleveland, it's it, it, up until the pandemic, um, you know, our whole issue was, it was about attraction and retention of employees. And so we ended up seeing, that's why there was this in-migration to downtown and the, the primary um, suburban markets were the Rockside Road, East Side, and then Westlake. Any of the other tertiary office markets were having negative absorption because you couldn't attract uh, employees there. So we'll One, see what um, that go ahead, David. I'm sorry. No, I'm, I'm done. I'm good. Okay. I just wanted to follow up on that because this might even be a question for you, David. Um, it's an issue. I think it's a, it's kind of a legal issue, but also just an operational issue is in an office environment. Um, and it has to do with the commute. And one of the things that we've done is stagger, you know, start times so that we don't have everybody um, showing up at the same time. And I, I would imagine in an office tower, um, that's going to be something that we're going to have to coordinate with the landlord and the other uh, tenants to make sure you know, everybody's not showing up at the same time. And, and the, the, the legal issue there, it's come up um, already, is, is, you know, what, what about wait time? Uh, you know, it, are your hourly employees going to be paid? How does that work? And, uh, you know, when they leave for lunch, um, does that now have to be paid? Uh, and, 
you know, the answer, <laughs> you know, there's, there's a legal answer too. And then there's, do you want, um, you know, a good morale? So, you know, if you're telling someone they've got to be there at a certain time and, and are they going to be late? Are they going to be disciplined? Probably not. Right. And, and so these are all issues that are going to pop up uh, when we, when we get back to full capacity, I think, I mean, now I thought the first day when um, the, uh, the non-essential was reopened, we were going to see an issue. I had actually I'd gotten in a little bit later that day uh, to prepare for it, but it wasn't necessary. Nobody had uh, really <laughs> gotten in. So I was, I was open. So David, if, I, I mean, I guess that's a question I have for you is how, what have you seen with that and how um, are you guys planning on dealing with it, with that issue? Well, uh, it, no, it, it, you've put, hit the nail on the head there in terms of it being an issue. And, you know, and again, because I wear these different hats, um, as the property manager, we really, we represent the ownership and then we're providing services and facilitating services to the tenants in these buildings. But ultimately the tenant, um, you know, has rights and obligations, as you know, under their lease. And they've got these obligations then to their employees. So as you, all of a sudden you go, there's employees, employers, building management, and then building ownership. And there's all these weird dynamics and we have rights and obligations under the lease, but we can't all be telling everyone what to do. We've got to kind of come to that middle ground. And so what we're finding, especially in, in our downtown uh, high-rise office buildings that we're managing, we're really having to spend time to talk to all the parties to understand what they're doing. What are their concerns? How are they thinking about it? Um, and, and then try to get all of these um, people to cooperate and collaborate together to end up at the, the best solution. Um, and I know you go, okay, well, boy, that that's a mouthful, but it, we're finding that that is the reality. It is, it, it's, we're all in this together and we've got to cooperate and collaborate with each other because I, as the building manager, certainly am not going to tell you, you know, as a, a big law firm tenant, what you're going to do with your employees. We need to find the middle ground. Am I making sense? No, that's, that's, that's a good point. I, I wonder, have you had um, any tenants collaborate uh, have a meeting and you know when I'm dealing with clients that have multi or in uh, multi-tenant buildings I I encourage them to reach out to the other tenants and talk to them and just communicate and determine you know when is your start times how many employees you have when are they going to show up how many elevators do we have you know is this going to work I mean because nobody wants um, sick employees or, or anybody to get sick you know, so we've got to do the best that we can with, with what we have to get everybody into the building on time. But I mean, I'm, I'm wondering if, have you guys actually organized any of these meetings or are you just allowing the tenants kind of to take the reins? We have helped, uh, it, you know, what we've done is we're collecting a lot of survey data regarding all of this. And we're getting into, okay, how many people are you going to be bringing back? What about the staggered shifts? And then are you going to be allowing visitors to your space? Because yeah. when you look at it, when we're managing the facility or you as a, a tenant are thinking about managing your space, you've got to manage who's coming in and, and it's your employees plus others potentially. And then we also have to think through and cause we've had it, we've had, you know, two of our buildings, both were suburban buildings, but you know, where we had positive COVID tests. And then, all right, what's your communication strategy? You've got to communicate with the health department. You've got to communicate with all the occupants in the buildings and then certain cleaning protocol and then so on and so forth. And then you've got to, you know, what's your cleaning um, procedures? And, you know, that involves some changes because, you know, the typical office tenant if you're purchasing cleaning services from your landlord, the old standards, they'd be vacuuming the, the carpet five days a week. Well, 
you know, we're thinking that, you know, look, let's save some money. Let's vacuum three days a week and spend more time um, cleaning surfaces. Um, and so we're, we're changing cleaning yeah. tracks um, and things like that. So again, I'm, I'm starting to wander around in the, no. in the rabbit hole of, of the issues. But what, what you're, we're trying to do is we're gathering a bunch of data from all these clients and then saying, ah, you should talk to each other. Like we ended up having in one of the buildings, um, one of the national tenants really got it together quickly as to what they felt they needed to do to reopen. So they had their space built out with um, the temperature control um, at the lobby area. They had the um, plastic screening in their reception area and screening in certain places. You've got you've to gotta have the pathway because you can't just have tenants now in your space to keep social distancing. They're not going to be walking back and forth in the same aisle. You've got to orchestrate typically a counterclockwise or clockwise flow of around your office to keep the six foot distancing. And so there's all sorts of signage and protocol. And then what are you doing related to, are you going to be serving coffee? Are your employees going to be eating in their, in the cap, if there's a cafeteria or a cafe. And so we ended up, have now been sharing some best practices with signage and, you know, this tenant has been, um, you know, proud of what they've done and they've shared it with several others. And it's helpful to see what one of these modified office spaces needs to be in terms of how to keep social distancing. Yeah, that's great. I, that's what I've been doing a lot of too, is helping clients um, develop these plans and look at their space and, you know, there's a lot of common elements to the plans, but there are some specific elements, you know, that are unique to each uh, employer or business that they have to really, and that's the important thing, what you're saying is sitting down, thinking these things through. And I'll tell you, once you get and start operating, there's going to be things you didn't think about that are going to come up, um, you know, here and there. There's some things, you know, and different. I, I'm helping a salon owner. They own several salons and you know, I didn't really, you know, the, the idea of a nurse or a doctor coming in that's had contact with the COVID, potentially had contact with the, do you cut their hair, you know, uh, just, you know, off the wall, I, you know, yeah, I think you probably, you know, should if they don't have other symptoms, right? Um, you know, and, and it's really up to the employee in a way in those situations. So things like that pop up. I mean, the, the thing you said about the, how people are walking around the office and the signage, I think it's really, really important to have simple, you know, signs up that, and, and as silly as it sounds, you know, cover your nose when you sneeze, um, social distance, six feet, you know, face coverings. That's another thing that we've dealt with quite a bit. Um, people are getting more comfortable with that now but um, all of those things need to be uh, really thought about um, within each specific uh, business well I, I, I Ryan David I I, I, I want to thank you both and uh, just uh, uh, bring things to a conclusion because uh, I, I think zoom may actually uh, cut us off very soon uh, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> this is this has been a terrific discussion though I, I really appreciate your your, your time and you know, at, at Downtown Cleveland Alliance, we're looking forward to working with uh, David, you and your team and, and all of the real estate firms and, and landlords in downtown. Uh, Ryan, uh, your, your team and your, your colleagues across downtown at, at, at making sure that we're all doing everything that we can uh, to ensure a clean and safe uh, office and work environment uh, in our buildings uh, and across downtown uh, so that we can uh, welcome uh, our, our downtown workers uh, back uh, where they belong in, in downtown Cleveland. Again, I want to thank you both for, for your time uh, and a really great dialogue today. Uh, and thanks to our, our team at Downtown Cleveland Alliance for uh, putting this together and our media partners at Cleveland Magazine and Community Leader. And thanks to our audience. We appreciate you and hope to see you next week at three o'clock. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye.